Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. This is the second lecture in this video series documenting my research work in the moisture durability of veneer-based mass timber products. In this lecture, we'll discuss tree growth, tree function, and the orthogonality of lumber material properties. Wood is unique among the major structural materials. Unlike steel or concrete, wood is not manufactured, it is grown. You don't make a two by four by mixing up some raw ingredients, pouring them into a mold and then letting it cool or react. Wood is a natural material, the product of half a billion years of evolutionary history. Wood as a material is optimized not for our purposes as human beings, but for the purposes of trees as they grow. And to understand the properties of lumber, you need to understand trees as living organisms. Unlike steel or concrete, wood is a biological material made from the stuff of life itself. Unlike steel or concrete, you must understand this biology in order to understand wood as a material. Wood is as it is, not as how we would wish it to be. If you are willing to meet it where it is, you can do great things with lumber and wood, but treat it like any ordinary material and you do so as at your own peril as an engineer. Wood is not homogeneous, it is not isotropic, and this will be the focus of today's lecture. Consider the fundamental photosynthetic reaction at the heart of all plant growth. Trees, like all plants, take carbon dioxide from the air and water from the soil. Powered by sunlight, they turn these into the sugars from which they assemble their physical forms. And along the way, they release oxygen, which, well, <laughs> we and other animals have a certain fondness for. And some components of this reaction have a very powerful influence on the forms trees have evolved into. So consider the three inputs of this reaction, carbon dioxide, water, and sunlight. These are the three main things trees must obtain from the environment. Now, uh, ca capturing CO2 from the air, while energetically difficult, need have little effect on the tree's overall large-scale structure. Uh, plants right near the forest floor can capture carbon dioxide just as well as those at the top of a forest canopy. But the sunlight and H2O? Well, those have powerful implications. Th this equation hints at two of the primary functions the trunk of a tree must be able to perform, and those are structural support and moisture transport. These are conifers growing on the slopes of Crater Lake in Oregon. Besides the aesthetic aspects of this image, I like how it illustrates the conditions in which trees must grow. If you go visit a very artificial environment, say a Christmas tree farm, uh, you'll find evergreen trees planted on flat ground a perfect ideal distance apart in a nice even grid. Uh, the farm operators will plant trees at this optimal distance to provide the most rapid and even growth possible. But these ideal conditions are not how trees must grow in nature. Look at the trees here. They're growing in what are certainly less than ideal conditions. They're growing in loose soil on a steep slope. In certain places along the lake rim, uh, not necessarily shown in this image, but in certain places along the uh, rim of the lake and Crater Lake, you'll actually see piles of dead trees killed by landslides. The slopes not only reduce uh, water retention and undermine the tree's roots, but the steep slope means that they will only have limited sunlight hours. Uh, in, this, in this picture, imagine if the sun is to the left. When the sun is to the left of this picture, the trees on this slope will be in shadow. You'll also find many trees growing uh, very close together, far closer than, ide than is ideal. Nature does not work with ideals. It works through chance and making do. Trees do not uh, choose where they live. They don't. They do not get it. They're not able to survey a large variety of potential sprouting spots and then uh, grow in the ideal one. No, they don't get to choose where they live. A seed falls where it may, or is blown by the wind. But moreover, each tree is not alone. That is very crucial. A single adult tree may produce and scatter thousands of seeds in a single year, scattering them blindly to the winds. Uh, each of those seeds must then sprout and then compete against each other for resources. Uh, each seed competes against uh, other seeds of its same species, or each tree competes against trees of its same species, and each species competes against each other. Uh, every organism in nature is in constant competition with other organisms for limited resources. And one of those resources? Well, sunlight. Sunlight, free as the air, may seem boundless and inexhaustible. And when you compare the raw, incredible energy output produced by our life-giving star to the amount that hits the Earth, well, it seems so. Less than a billionth of the total light output of the sun actually reaches our planet. The cross-sectional area of our planet at our, at our distance from the sun represents less than a billionth of the total area uh, of a sphere of that orbital radius. 
the sun is so prolific that it can create enough light to sustain a billion Earths and then cast all but a billionth of that unused out into the infinite void of the cosmos, and yet our world still thrives. But here below those heavens, uh, here on the ground, here on Earth, sunlight is limited. Uh, most of the Earth, for example, is covered in water. Of that, of what remains, most is too dry, too cold, or too high of an elevation for trees to grow. On the rare patches of ground uh, suitable for arboreal life, there is a finite amount of sunlight available per unit acre, and all the plants on a patch of ground must compete against each other for that limited sunlight. If plants lack sufficient sunlight, they can address this in several ways. They could evolve to more efficiently handle the light they do receive by somehow improving the molecular machinery of photosynthesis. They could evolve broader leaves or thicker needles. Or, when competing against each other, they can grow taller. Now, growing taller does have its benefits for plants. If there was only a single plant spread across the entire world, it could forgo height and spread as a thin carpet across the ground, a kind of giant living solar panel. But by growing taller, trees are able to literally outshadow smaller plants around them. Once established, an older tree can prevent newer trees from growing near it, reducing competition for other resources. Trees compete against each other, stretching ever higher to reach for any last scrap of sunlight that they can. Often, plants will even grow preferentially in the direction where sunlight is most abundant. So, for example, if you look out in a forest, you can sometimes even find trees that, if they happen to sprout in a location with insufficient sunlight, they might start by growing vertical and then sort of you know, uh, jog off at a 45 degree angle for a while and then curve back up to vertical. They will grow preferentially in the direction where sufficient sunlight can be obtained. And again, sunlight is crucial. After all, for all of a tree's complexity, for all of the intricate molecular machinery involved inside every one of its cells, sunlight is what's powering this entire thing. Sunlight is essential, is as essential to plants as the food we eat is to ourselves. But growing taller is not without consequences. A tree cannot suspend its leaves high in the air by a magical levitation. It must support them. It must act as a structure. A section of a tree's trunk must support the trunk above it, all the necessary branches and twigs, plus the weight of the leaves themselves, plus uh, the moisture within the tree, etc. Uh, growing taller also has consequences for lateral loads. Uh, the weight we discussed are vertical loads, but lateral loads, loads to the side, also are important, horizontal loads. Uh, wind speeds are lower closer to the ground, and the taller you grow, the uh, higher the wind speeds up, higher up in your branches, and also the greater of an area you present to the oncoming wind. Trees, because of structural and other limitations, do have a height limit. Past a certain point, the additional effort to grow taller is not worth the additional cost. Yes, you may be able to outcompete other trees around you by growing a bit taller, but the negative consequences eventually overcome the positive consequences or the positive benefits of growing taller. This optimum maximum height will vary with species, elevation, and climate, but biology and evolution are all about optimization and trade-offs. All of natural selection is not about optimizing for a single variable, growing as tall as you can, uh, you know, growing as large as you can, producing as many seeds as you can. It's all about optimizing for different variables, uh, all competing in the same mix of survival. Evolution is all about trade-offs, and trees are no exception. The second primary function a tree's trunk must perform is moisture and nutrient transport. While some trees can absorb some moisture through their leaves directly from the air, the bulk of the water a tree needs to live comes from the ground. As water has a natural tendency to fall to, pool on, and be absorbed into the ground, well, this is not unexpected. At the same time, the sugars that trees use as their food source and molecular building blocks are formed in the leaves. The leaves need water from the roots, and the roots need sugars and other compounds from their leaves. Their trunks and branches serve to support and connect these two crucial elements. Trees need their trunks and branches, but these do not produce any food or absorb any water. Their leaves and roots perform these vital functions. A tree thus needs a way of transporting moisture and minerals up its trunk from the roots to the leaves, and then transporting sugars back down from the leaves to the living cells in the trunk and roots. Trees lack the complex active circulatory systems found in mammals and other large animals, but they have the same need for water and nutrient transport that uh, we and other animals do. They don't have a heart that beats to pump blood around their bodies like we do and other animals do, but the, instead they have to use passive measures rather than the active pump circulatory systems that vertebrates do. 
but for all the complexity of trees, what are they fundamentally made of? You know, go and stand in a great forest. You know, go to a forest where the trees are towering around you. Or, you know, even better, go to the redwoods in uh, California and look at these ancient grand trees that have been preserved uh, from the logger's axe and go and see all of the uh, trees around you. Just stand there and watch as you're dwarfed by these uh, great trees around you. Uh, you know, stand in this forest and it seems incomprehensible. From where does all this majesty arise? And for all these functions, well, what tools does nature actually have at its disposal? Well, it's the same tool nature ever always has. From the tiniest amoeba to the mightiest redwood, uh, from the very stuff of the mind and human consciousness, all of these are made of cells, as cells are the fundamental building blocks from which all living things are made. Well, if we want to debate whether viruses are alive, that's another thing entirely. But in terms of any kind of macroscopic organism, all of those are built of cells. Nature works with cells. If it's going to build anything, it has to build with cells. Now, when I say cell, you may imagine something like what is shown here. These images are just taken from Wikipedia and are something you've probably seen before or something similar. They're the kind of generic cell visualizations you may find in a high school biology class. And while these diagrams are useful for educational purposes, they are simplifications. These illustrations are idealizations. They are not meant to portray cells as they actually occur in a specific organism or in a specific part of an organism. Rather, they are educational illustrations meant to illustrate the various parts of a cell uh, to help the learner learn what those parts are. They aren't meant to realistically display cells in their actual form and shape, but just to help, again to help students learn the various components. And for that, they are certainly useful. Uh, they illustrate, for example, that one of the key distinguishing features between plant and animal cells is the presence of a rigid cell wall in plant cells, which animal cells lack. And that is relevant to our discussion here. Still, it is important to realize their limitations. They are insufficient for our discussion here, not because they lack important details, which they almost certainly do. I'm sure a biologist could point out all sorts of vital cellular components that aren't displayed in these diagrams. I'm sure these diagrams leave out all sorts of little parts for the sake of brevity and readability. But the actual details of the cellular machinery are not vital to our discussion here. Again, I am an engineer. The properties and function of the endoplasmic reticulum, as vital as they are for life, are not my concern. This is civil engineering with Tony J. Laird, not biology with Tony J. Laird. Rather, my problem with this illustration of a plant cell is that it does not accurately represent what cells and trees actually look like, not even remotely. A tree cell in overall form is nothing like the cuboid form shown to the right. To understand the function of trees on a cellular level, we need to go beyond these idealizations and consider what wood cells actually look like as they actually occur in living trees and in lumber as well. Shown here is a more realistic look at what wood cells actually look like. On the left is a highly magnified image and on the right is a schematic diagram. The key feature to note is that wood cells are much, much longer than they are wide. You will often hear wood uh, analogized or conceptualized as a series of straws bundled together. And while this is not a perfect analogy, it is useful. Individual wood cells can be 10 to 100 times longer than they are wide. Now, why are they shaped like this? This is not an easy form for cells to grow in. Think of what is involved for cells to grow and live like this. All of the cell's internal machinery must also be similarly stretched. Think of all the parts that we saw in the previous diagram. All of those exist within the wood cells. All of them have to be, in turn, similarly stretched, just like the cell walls shown here are stretched. Instead of a nice semi-spherical or semi-cuboid shape, the cells are stretched out into this very awkward, long, straw-like shape. And these cells still have to somehow remain alive as they live like this. Think of all the complexity of an ordinary cell, all of the countless pieces that must work together in their symphony of organized molecular chaos, and now figure out a way to make all of that work in such a long and narrow space. It seems absurd. I mean, it is very hard uh, to think how cells, even wood cells, ever manage to even do this. Why would nature select for such a seemingly ridiculous solution? Why not just make a tree, a, a tree trunk, from a large pile of nice cubes or ovoids? Ultimately, well, like all things in evolution, this is a case where form follows function. 
uh, to understand why wood cells are shaped like this, even though from the point of the machinery of a living cell, this must be an absolute nightmare to deal with, uh, it does make sense when you consider the function of, of a tree. Let's consider the, tree, the two functions we previously discussed, structural support and moisture transport, and see how those lead to the kind of structural and other forms that we see in wood cells shown here. So a tube or hollow column is actually a very structurally efficient shape. This form can be seen in individual structural elements or entire structural systems. On the level of an individual member, uh, hollow square sections or HSS steel shapes are very common, and hollow circular columns are also common. By concentrating a cross-section's area along its perimeter by making a hollow shape, you maximize its flexural capacity and buckling resistance. Circular tubes are optimal for resisting loads from any direction. Tubes also form, uh, are also used as a form for entire structures or buildings. Many of the world's tallest buildings are tubular structures. Rather than being built for, with a uniform rectangular frame throughout, they are built as hollow tubes with, re with a reinforced core. Uh, shown on the left is the Willis, formerly the Sears Tower. It is built as a series of bundled tubes of various heights. Uh, the old original World Trade Center, whose floor plan is shown on the right, was built with an outer structural tube surrounding an inner core. The gap between uh, the, the inner core and the outer tube uh, allowed for long, uninterrupted floor plates uh, free from columns and, and other protuberances. Uh, another example would be the Burj Khalifa. It is also built with a similar tube structural form. When you are trying to reach to a great height while minimizing weight and material, a uh, tubular or bundled tubular form is a very efficient way to go. And what applies to our buildings applies to trees as well. A structurally efficient form is a structurally efficient form. Uh, this is one case where, well, I suppose you might say that uh, nature figured it out first, and then eventually we figured that when making some of our taller structures, that we can uh, borrow some of the forms in nature. A efficient, a, a tubular, hollow tubular form is a very efficient structural shape, whether it occurs on the cellular level of a of a tree cell or in lumber or in a much larger form, much larger shape, or much larger scale uh, of a super tall building. And what of the second function that we discussed, uh, moisture transport? Well, this is where the straw analogy, remember we discussed uh, that a common analogy for lumber is uh, a series of straws bundled together? Well, this is a case where the straw analogy becomes much more literal. Much like an actual drinking straw, the long tubular shape of wood cells does greatly facilitate the transport of water and nutrients along the trunk and branches of a tree. Of course, there are a few important caveats. I should note that when lumber is used in service, mo most moisture transport will occur through diffusion, the transport of moisture through solid cell walls themselves, not through the interiors of the cells or outside them. Diffusion will be discussed more in a later lecture. Also, in a living tree, uh, moisture transport within and between cells occurs through a combination of surface wetting, vapor transport, capillary action, and other mechanisms. Also, while wood cells are much longer than they are wide, the length of an individual cell is still very, very small compared to the length of a tree trunk or branch. Individual cells are still a fraction of a millimeter in length. Actual straws, in contrast, are driven by uh, pressure differences and present and, and present a continuous path for fluid to travel. So there's not a there is not a continuous uh, straw uh, that for material for fluid to transport from the top of a trunk to the bottom. There is a uh, you know a series of woods of longitudinal wood cells aligned one after another in series. And there are mechanisms for moisture to pass from one wood cell to another, but it's not like there's actually one continuous straw going all the way up the length of a tree. So it is a it is a useful analogy, but we should be aware of its limitations. Still, the analogy is useful for, for is useful uh, for conceptual purposes. A series of bundled together uh, of bundled together cells provide better moisture transport than a large pile of uh, cubicle or spherical cells. Again. Think back to that original, you know, sort of grade school drawing of uh, or diagram of a uh, of a plant cell, where it's just this nice spherical or cubical shape. And imagine if you had a tree composed of all of those. Well, every time it's going to cross a cell wall, uh, moisture is going to have a, uh, going to have to cross a barrier. Uh, but if you have this long uh, tubular form, it decreases the number of cell walls that moisture has to cross. So this long tubular shape does greatly assist in moisture transport up and down the trunk and along the branches of a living tree. And this tubular cellular structure has some profound effects on wood as a material.
An isotropic material is one that exhibits the same properties, such as strength, stiffness, conductivity, etc., in all directions. Steel is an isotropic material. If you have a small cube of steel and test its stiffness in each of its primary axes, you'll get the same uh, result. Stretch it to the left and right, up and down, forwards and backwards, it doesn't matter. You should get this, uh, close to the same result. Steel is, at least on any scale we deal with, isotropic. Now, if you have a piece of steel so small that you're, uh, you know, you have a little piece, of, you have a microscopic piece of steel small enough that it's on the same order of magnitude as steel's grain structure, then it will be less isotropic. But on any scale that we deal with, uh, anything that you'll actually be constructing something uh, as an engineer with, it is or might as well be isotropic. An anisotropic material is the opposite, one that exhibits material properties that vary with direction. Wood is an example of such an anisotropic material, and the tubular cellular structure of wood produces this anisotropy. Now, we could find many examples of various material properties that reflect the anisotropic nature of wood, but one simple result or simple example that can be seen is the allowable strength values found in the NDS, the Standard Reference Text for Structural Wood Design in the United States. In compression, wood will exhibit much greater strength parallel to grain than perpendicular to grain. In tension, wood strength perpendicular to grain is so low that for purposes of structural design, it is treated as zero. But why should we have such reduced strength perpendicular to grain? To understand this, we must consider evolution and natural selection. Consider a tree as a structure. What kinds of external forces must a tree be able to resist? Now, as a complex organism in a natural environment, there will be all sorts of edge cases we can think of. However, the primary forces they must resist are wind and their own self-weight. And add to this in snowy locales the weight of snow and the increased wind load that comes from carrying that snow. And of course there are, are all sorts of other loads. Um, if some bird nests in the tree, I'm sure that adds some amount to the gravity load. If, a, if an earthquake hits, well then you can have lateral and uh, up and down loads as well. But the two primary loads that trees must face in uh, their ordinary uh, course of business are their own self-weight, uh, the weight of anything they're carrying, and uh, the weight uh, or the force of wind applied to them laterally. Again, if we think of this in terms of structural loads, this represents an applied lateral and vertical load. Wind will produce a lateral force and self-weight will produce a vertical or gravity load. Again, there may be other loads applied, but these are the primary ones that will most affect uh, the structural internal uh, stresses and strains inside a tree. So, from these applied external, uh, lateral, and vertical forces, let's think of what kind of internal forces will be generated from these in the trunk of a tree. And if we think of the internal forces induced in the trunk of the tree, these wind and gravity forces will produce axial forces, typically compression, shear, and moment. Or, if we consider stresses, both axial force and moment will produce axial stresses. Moment will produce couples of tension and compression along the grain, and the gravity loads will produce an axial stress. Internal shear forces will be, of course, expressed as shear stresses. If you were to classify trees as a structure, they would be approximated as a cantilever beam. They are rooted in a fixed connection to the ground. In addition, because of their propensity to grow as tall as practical, they have very large moment arms compared to their cross-sectional areas. Like other long, slender structures, the lateral loads imposed upon them produce large flexural stresses compared to relatively smaller shear stresses. Compression and flexure are both carried as, as axial stresses, thus trees must carry larger stresses parallel to their trunks than perpendicular to their trunks. The tubular structural form of wood, with wood cells primarily oriented along the length of a trunk or branch, is thus advantageous. There are very few forces in a natural setting that would cause a tree to experience tension or compression perpendicular to its trunk. Now, if I, would, if I wanted to do this, I could go out into the woods and do this if I wanted to. I could artificially cause a tree to experience compression perpendicular to its trunk and grain by, say, uh, I could wrap a large, a large chain around its trunk and then pull that tight. Or I could cause a, t a tree to experience tension perpendicular to its grain or trunk by driving a wedge into it. If I were so determined, I could find a way to apply a force in almost any direction to the trunk of a tree. But in their natural setting, trees will primarily experience tension and compression stresses, uh, compression and, and tension, tensile and compressive axial stresses parallel to the grain and uh, also shear stresses. 
If a tree were formed from a large pile of cubical or spherical cells, it would be much more isotropic and thus have an, an equal or a reasonably equal ability to resist forces in all directions or to resist stresses in all directions. However, such a form would not be as efficient for the types of loads trees experience in their natural environment. And thus, natural selection has optimized trees to have long, thin cells oriented along their trunks and branches. This is similar to pressures that have caused the tallest buildings to be built with uh, tubular structural forms. The largest forces of very tall buildings experience are gravity loads and lateral wind loads, and thus their design is dominated by stresses along their vertical axes. Trees and super tall buildings have actually converged on the tubular structural form for many of the very same reasons, or perhaps we have simply learned to imitate nature in the design of our tallest buildings. Now, uh, let us again consider moisture transport. In a living tree, only a small portion of the cross-section of a tree is actively growing and living at any one time. The only portion of a tree that is actively growing new cells is the cambium. Uh, consider the diagram on the right. We have the outer bark, the phloem, the cambium, the sapwood, and the heartwood. Um, a tree can be thought of almost as a wave growing outwards over many years. Only the cambium layer is the layer that actually grows new cells. The cambium grows new bark cells on its exterior and sapwood cells on its interior. As new cells are laid down, the cambium layer gradually expands in, the diam in diameter and moves outward. A tree 100 feet tall can thus be produced by a layer of cells no thicker than your fingernail. If, and that's actually why if... Uh, if, if uh, uh, if you were to go and say like scrape off the bark and the cambium in a ring around a tree, that would actually kill a tree. That, that, that is a method of killing trees and sometimes some nefarious people do for vandalism purposes and, and trees in certain locales. Um, the inner bark and phloem and the outer bark uh, serve primarily to protect this cambium from exterior threats. Interior to the cambium, the, sap, the sapwood and heartwood exist. The sapwood is called this because this is where, well, the sap is present. And that sap is the actual water or nutrient solution that needs to be transported up and down a tree, moisture up to the leaves and nutrients down to the roots. Interior to the sapwood is the heartwood. Here, in the oldest parts of the tree, little active moisture transport still occurs. After sapwood has grown a sufficient distance from the cambium, the inner layers of sapwood become filled with extractives, which are preservative uh, compounds that help protect the now non-living interior layers. This, ex this extractive-filled core is referred to as the heartwood, and it no, long provi no longer provides much uh, moisture transport. Rather, it serves only as structural support. Now, we have discussed the need to transport moisture up and down the trunk, or parallel to the trunk, but what about perpendicular to the axis of the trunk? Consider what degree of moisture transport is necessary perpendicular to the axis of a trunk or branch. To supply the needs of the cambium, if we're imagine we're moving moisture up and down the sapwood and we need to supply moisture to the cambium so it can keep growing new cells. Well, to supply the moisture needs of the cambium, uh, moisture and nutrients need to only move the very short distance from the, the sapwood to the cambium. This distance can be small, as small as a few centimeters, even for trees many meters tall. So when we're transporting moisture in the uh, along the trunk or along the grain, we need to move moisture many, many meters. But to, to, to transport moisture perpendicular to the grain or perpendicular to the trunk, we only need to move the moisture a few centimeters. So we can see that the need to transport moisture is much, much, much greater uh, along the axis of a, 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 of a uh, along the axis of a trunk or branch than perpendicular to it. Now, uh, despite the short distances involved, trees still do need to provide for the moisture transport perpendicular to their trunk and branches. In this image from Schmelsky and Jones, note the ray cells indicated by G and H. Most of the cells of wood are shown oriented along the length of a tree's trunk along its longitudinal axis, which is shown vertically in this image. But some of the cells do run perpendicular to this direction, and they provide for moisture and nutrient transport perpendicular to the trunk or branches. Although trees mostly need to transport moisture and nutrients parallel to their trunk and branches, some small amount is still needed in this perpendicular direction, and some trees have evolved some cells, called ray cells, uh, to provide for this. So, we have seen that there is a strong directionality in two of the primary functions of the trunk and branches of trees, structural support and moisture transport. 
In terms of structure, axial stresses directed along the length of a trunk dominate over transverse stresses perpendicular to the trunk. In terms of moisture transport, the need to transport moisture and nutrients along the length of a tree's trunk dwarf the needs to transport these perpendicular to the trunk. And, then, and inevitably, this has had a strong effect on the cellular structure of wood. Think back to the idealized grade school model of a plant cell, with the cell walls formed in, in these nice uniform cuboid shapes. If trees were built of such cells, wood would be fairly homogeneous and isotropic. Uh, but trees do not have cells shaped in this manner, and the reason for this is natural selection. Evolution is not kind. One of my favorite sayings in regard to the evolution, which I believed I first heard from the uh, esteemed Isaac Arthur, is that every organism alive today is the survivor of the four billion year deep corpse pile known as natural selection. Evolution is not compassionate and it is not kind. Every organism in a natural environment exists in stiff, continuous competition for resources, for space, against predators, etc. Species compete against each other, and members of and groups within individual species compete with each other. And ultimately, every single physical trait of every organism on this planet has been shaped by these forces. Natural selection is why life ever got more complex than the crude R uh, RNA multiplication uh, in the first place. The first, the, it's hypothesized that the first uh, organisms were these very crude, barely self-replicating strands of RNA or something. And if we didn't have natural selection, that's all life would have ever been able to accomplish. Traits that are beneficial are propagated, traits that are detrimental slowly disappear. And this is ultimately why wood has the cellular structure that it does. A tree with long, thin cells oriented along the length of the, its trunk and branches is more efficient than one that has a uniform, isotropic cellular structure. This cellular structure, which defines the grain of wood, derives fundamentally from the core functions a tree must perform. And even though a tree is no longer living once we cut it down and turn it into lumber, the orthogonality that has evolved to serve a living tree does not disappear. Now, all of the wet parts of a cell, like all the living machinery inside trees, does cease to dance, do its molecular dance when a tree dies. But the cell wall, those rigid exterior plant cell walls, when a tree dies, those cell walls remain, and those are the useful portions that we actually build wooden structures out of. And as we saw in the case of allowable uh, design strengths, parallel and perpendicular to grain, this cellular orthogonality has direct effects on the properties of the lumber we use to build our structures. Though we use lumber for our own purposes, wood is ultimately, at its very core, a biological material. It is not made, it is grown, and every one of its properties has been optimized by eons of evolution to serve the needs of trees in their natural environment, to, not to serve our needs. Our challenge as engineers is to take this natural material, evolve for purposes very different from our own, and find ways to most effectively use it for our purposes. And my research is part of this process. And that will do it for today. As a review, in this lecture we discuss some of the core functions the trunk and branches of a tree must perform, that being structural support and moisture transport. We reviewed the cellular structure of wood and how that cellular structure is optimized for these core functions. We concluded by exploring this through the lens of natural selection and framing how our use of wood as an engineering material must bend to the properties that nature has selected for in the cellular, in the cellular design of wood. In the next lecture, we'll be defining the three principal axes of lumber, and we'll see how these are translated in wood veneers and wood panels. This lecture is slowly building up the background and details that inform my research work and define my research questions, and the orthogonality discussed here is at the core of my research work. I hope you found this interesting and perhaps a bit informative or educational. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. If you'd like to help contribute to this research, there is a Patreon link in the comments. Uh, unless otherwise noted, the images found throughout this lecture were taken by me in various locations throughout the state of Oregon and Northern California. Again, I hope you found this enjoyable or at least a bit informative. I thank you for watching. I hope you enjoy it. I look forward to seeing you all again. And as always, thank you.